Welcome to Leeds Beckett University. Uh, my name is Katie Shaw and I'll be hosting Paul Mason tonight and um, also later hosting the Boom Bust crew who have just arrived, hopped from, as I understand it, the fiery depths of Leeds tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming to tonight's event and a special thanks to those of you who've been here like me all day at our post-capitalism conference. Uh, some really brilliant discussions going on there. Uh, tonight, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Paul Mason to Leeds Beckett University. Paul is economics editor at Channel 4 News, having previously worked at the BBC, and also, obviously, you might know him from his Guardian column and various other broadcasts he has done throughout his career and writings. Um, Paul has written a number um, of texts. Post-capitalism, which is obviously for sale in the foyer, signed copies, no less, um, is his latest work. Um, for me, it is the most important book of 2015. It offers us a really timely thinking document about potential ways forward from our current context. So, without further ado, tonight, would you please join me in welcoming Paul Mason. Well, thank you very much, Katie, and uh, thanks for those very kind words. Um, I'm really grateful for you organising a, a day event about a title around my book. Um, it's not often until you're dead that people uh, <laughs> do, do events titled around your work. So good. Um, so right, I'll talk for about 30 minutes, then we'll have a discussion and then you can uh, fire things at me. It's a shortish uh, time we have. So I'm going to give you the chatty version, not the read out version. Okay, so Almost as long as industrial capitalism has existed, people have been predicting that it's going to collapse. Thomas Malthus, uh, Smith himself, Ricardo, the uh, 19th century economist, uh, all obsessed with the limits to capital. It's the fragility of its ability to reproduce itself. And it's no surprise, therefore, when we get the fully fred mill as well, the fully fledged critique in the late 19th century, the mid to late 19th century, by Marx, that again, Marx stands in the tra tradition of analysing the contradictions of capitalism in a, in a search for what will cause it to end. And I think Marx was asking the right question. But what all those thinkers have in common is that I think they underestimated its complexity and its adaptivity. And so when my book plonks onto the desk of numerous reviewers, like people in the Sunday Times, the Times, the Telegraph, the Daily Mail, all they can think about is, oh, here's another person predicting that capitalism is going to be either ended, overthrown or overcome. So he must be wrong. So for the very beginning, what I want to, to try and emphasise is that I think capitalism is a complex and adaptive system. Now, those of you who work in the field of systems theory, which now crosses between psychology, psychiatry, science, all kinds of you know, um, areas, engineering, uh, will know that you know, this is a buzzword, the, the complex and adaptive system. But I think it's a good way of describing it and a good way of preempting uh, this kind of knee-jerk critique that the right have had in my book, which is oh, people are always predicting the overthrow of capitalism. What I'm saying is, it, sum, you can sum it up in one phrase, after which you, you can go back to your screen if you like to and find out what's happening with the fire and everything. But though, if you just pay attention to, to this, it's simply, capitalism is a complex adaptive system who's, that's lost its capacity to adapt. That's the theory, in a nutshell. And that's what makes it different, even to the sophisticated critique that Marx outlined, and which I will come back to. And it's lost its capacity to adapt because of information technology. So that's the big claim which is now associated with the idea of post-capitalism. What is the evidence for that? Well, item one, evidence one, 101, is what's happened to neoliberalism. <coughs> By neoliberalism, some people, when they discuss neoliberalism, talk about the ideology. And there's a big uh, academic study of the, ideology, uh, the ideas of neoliberalism. The Mont Pelerin Society, you know, uh, Hayek, Friedman, um, you know, Ayn Rand. That famous moment in The Simpsons where Maggie is sent to a, uh, a nursery called the Ayn Rand School for Tots, uh, <laughs> where on the wall there is a sign saying, helping is futile. Um, 
<laughs> and that's very interesting to study that. But for me, the study of neoliberalism, neoliberalism is the study of a historically specific era of capitalism. So an objective thing, not simply a set of ideas. And by an objective thing, I mean the whole of the world economy as it has been shaped <laughs> primarily by marketization, globalization, uh, and what happened to the organized labor, which we'll come to. So, in other words, Deng Xiaoping's China after 1987 is as much a part of the neoliberal reality for me as is Thatcher's Britain. I'm not just talking about one country, I'm talking about a world system. Neoliberalism is broken. And it's broken for the following reasons. All its achievements were based on one innovation for me, and that is what we call fiat money. Those of you who studied Latin will know that the word fiat does not just mean a car, um, but it means uh, let there be, or as in let there be light, fiat lux. Now, uh, which is in the first page of the Bible. Um, so <clears throat> fiat money is about states saying let there be money independently of A, precious metals, and B, the amount of economic activity that that money is supposed to represent. And this, those of you from my age group and above will know, happened in 1973 when Richard Nixon finally uh, took America off uh, what was left of back the, the, the old Bretton Woods Agreement, agreed at the end of the Second World War, uh, to link currencies to metal and to link currencies to each other. So from about the mid-70s, we get money independent of economic activity. And what does it allow you to do? Something really, really good and benign. Capitalism, as those of you, again, who live, some of you may have even, really, you know, my mother was born in 1935, so if there's anybody here who's that age, 80, you know, you'll remember the Depression, and you will certainly have lived a life where capitalism does this, it just goes up and down, there are crises, there are stoppages, there is a stop-go go aspect to it. Um, fiat money allows you to smooth that out, because with, with every slowdown, you just hit it with an extra adrenaline injection uh, of, um, of money. And so neoliberalism has about 10 years when it's on the go in the early 90s, uh, it smooths out, um, we call it the Goldilocks era because it's neither too hot nor too, too cold. Uh, and, and suddenly, bang, 1997, Asian crisis, response, print money, cheapen money, flood the markets with extra money. Bang, 2000, 2001, dot-com boom. Why did that happen? Because there was a lot of money sloshing around. Uh, you'll see the pattern emerge. Response, turn on the taps. Federal Reserve says, Ben Bernanke says, we have a printing press. We cannot go bust. We print the money. That leads to 2008. Bang, again, the world blows up. And this time it's uh, very serious. It's, it's, it, it, it takes growth negative on a scale where anything below 3% is deemed uh, quasi a recession worldwide. Um, response, quantitative easing, $12 trillion worth of printed free money. You can see the pattern. And this would work fantastically well if there were no workers in the world. Because <clears throat> as long as you're printing money, and it's boosting the, what's, what, does, do, what does it do? What does it typically do? We all know, you probably know this in Leeds, but where I live in South London, we can really see it on the skyline. It makes it really sensible to invest in assets, in things, rather than in production. So you buy skyscrapers or you build skyscrapers. And that can't go wrong because as long as you're doing that and somebody else is investing in fine wine and somebody else is investing in um, cornering the supply of uh, uranium in the world and put it in a warehouse till its price goes up, then the cheap money aspect of things will always keep that going. Uh, were it not for one problem, the central institution of capitalism, way before neoliberalism, but it is the sine qua non, the institution of neoliberalism, is credit. We'll discuss why in a minute. But you, know, you do not have to be a, a mathematician to work this out. If you're endlessly expanding the supply of money, and, and therefore endlessly expanding the supply of credit and, in, and even since 2008 we have, we, the, the, the amount of credit in the world has risen by 57 trillion dollars taking it to three times world GDP. It was only one times world GDP at the end of World War II, it's now three times world GDP. Credit is a promise to pay back with interest what you've been lent 
on the basis of you're going to earn some more. There's going to be growth. The problem is not just the, prob the, the, the fact that growth is quite stagnant despite the 12 trillion we've printed. The strategic problem is that, that in America, since 1973, the male median hourly wage has been flat, stagnant. Wages are suppressed while credit expands. So, you know, those of you familiar with the kind of crude and underconsumption theory, whereby the consumption of the masses cannot sustain capitalism, therefore it falls apart. This is associated with Rosa Luxemburg, the Marxist <coughs> theorist in the uh, pre war, pre 1914 era, also with Keynes, also with classic Stalinism uh, in the mid 1930s. Those of you who are familiar with that will uh, know that it's, it's wrong. You know, you can't. The, 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 the capitalism never collapses because of the underconsumption of workers. In a stagnant wage situation, what you do get is it repeat that the, the credit system repeatedly falls apart under the pressure of, of, of incomes stagnating and being unable to c carry on sustaining its expanded uh, growth. And that's basically what's been behind every boom and bust we've, we've lived through. Of course, the other problem about these boom and busts, they don't just, uh, it's not a cycle, it's not an oscillation. It may seem like that, but of course it has an effect on the real world. The 1997 crisis basically deglobalized the finance system. It led to Asian countries building their own financial surpluses, which they still have, you know, the sovereign wealth funds, Singapore, that buy things like... British steel um, companies. Uh, that's where that originates. Then you get 2000, the 2000 2001 bust. What does that wipe out? It wipes out the company pension system. Increasingly, it's closed to workers, new workers. And then 2008 wipes out a huge chunk of the welfare state uh, across the world. You will retire at 70. You will be in debt uh, for 30 years after you leave college. Uh, all of that. It doesn't just have an, a non effect. So fiat money is like a clock that keeps being wound up that, that when it kind of ticks down to alarm time, explodes. And the response of neoliberalism is simply to wind it up again and again and again and again. And that's where you are now. And I'm pretty certain, although I can't predict when, there's going to be another bust. This time probably uh, intertwined with geopolitics. And if a bank or a country goes bust this time, as the Greeks were terrified of this summer when I was there covering that, Everybody knows what will happen. That this time, it's not the pension system or the welfare state. It is your bank account that will be raided to pay for it. Why are we in this mess? Because, not just because of fiat money, because of financialization. Long word. If there was a shorter version of it, I would really like to hear it. But it's an important concept. It means that, see, my dad's generation, if you said to them, my dad worked for a company called Ward and Goldstone in Salford, and Mr. Goldstone used to sit in the top office, and when there was a strike, he'd come down and visit them with a crate of Guinness. And this is a large company as well. It wasn't a sort of, you know, SME. Um, and uh, if you'd asked my dad who makes money from your work in a classic sort of social democratic way, he would have said Mr. Goldstone, and he would have been right. But if you ask the equivalent now, uh, young people, the, the logical question would be, the person you work for, the company you work for, and the myriad of companies from whom you buy and sell things, um, and the person who owns your credit card. And in fact, the person who, who, who is the, the bank that is supplying your credit card is getting a rate of return way in excess of any normal operational profit that a, that a, a manufacturing company would get. Now, as a result, our lives have become financialized. That is, Everything we do is already a financial asset before we've done it. I join a gym, all that's happened to my gym membership is it's already sitting there in a bond or a, a financial instrument packaged up with other gym memberships and somebody's already taken a bet on it about whether I rejoin next January. Answer probably yes. Uh, but, but in other words, the financialization of life creates a dual or even triple profit stream to capital from production, from consumption and from credit in a way that no other generation has ever seen. And as a result of that, why are we interested in that? Because of the other big fact of neoliberalism, and that is the smashing of the workers' ability to bargain. And this is a major thing. See, 
One of the things that people who don't like my book say is, you know, David Cameron's not a neoliberal, is he? You know, he's not smashed any workers. Well, the point is that you don't have to re-smash them if they're pre-smashed. <laughs> uh, and um, they come pre-smashed. Labour rights, labour organisation across the West. The Japanese began it. Those of you, again, working class people, workers, remember in the 1970s, it was Japan that started the so-called rationalisation of trade unions and work by the uh, highly um, inventive and technologically uh, advanced me method of taking shop stewards out and beating them up until they ceased to protest. Um, and you know the rest of the story, Thatcher, Reagan. Reagan had the, uh, the air traffic controllers, leaders in chains. Now, the, the effect is the wage share of GDP in many Western countries has declined since then. Many wages have been either flat or risen nowhere near in line with inflation. The profit share increases. So we end up with a situation where you've got suppressed working class, heavily financialised life, so that you know, go on a working class town, yes, you get the boots and the next, etc., but you get the cheap money, sorry, the expensive money shop, that is the pawnbrokers and the payday loan shop, the free food place, the, the, the food bank, uh, the... the myriad charity shops, and then the unseen hidden gold mine of the modern town, this, the, the employment agency, where high-skilled jobs for low pay can be done with no uh, assurance of permanence whatsoever. That is, modern, that is neoliberal. If you like it, brilliant. You know, go around shouting how brilliant it is, but the problem is it's blowing up again and again. Now, there's one other problem with it, and that is... Despite mobilising the resources of science and technology, I would argue, and the Oxford professor of information theory, Luciano Floridi, says, to a scale never before seen, your generation has greater power over reality, thanks to information technology, than any other generation. Despite that, the third industrial revolution, long advertised, is stalled. And why? I say... We're drawing on the work of uh, a Soviet uh, economist, non-Marxist Soviet economist called Nikolai Kondratiev, that the, the pattern of adaptation that capitalism normally goes through is you get a kind of, we call it, let's call it a societal business model, a kind of a thing that works. Those of you who lived through the, say, 1948 to 1973, you lived through a post-war boom where everybody <coughs> knew what you did, how you set up a business, what you do in a business, how you make money, how you don't make money. There's a kind of Implicit knowledge, um, what uh, we call a techno, a techno economic paradigm, it's clear that works for a while, then it doesn't. And normally, for 250 years, what industrial capitalism does is it, it goes through a crisis at, as the, the wave reaches its peak, as the business model reaches maturity, and that in that mo moment of crisis, the first response of employers is to solve the crisis by maintaining the unworkable business model and suppressing wages. And in every other moment of adaptation, going through from the 1840s, Chartism, through to the 1870s and 80s, the rise of labour and unskilled trade unionism, going I would, through, I would say, to the 1920s and even the 30s, you get the, this attempt at a low-wage adaptation that fails because workers resist. And when they resist, a little light bulb goes on somewhere in somebody's workshop. Oh, better, actually, if we solve this problem by abandoning the old business model and innovating some new, te new technologies. That's the normal pattern of that adaptation. And I argue, number one, that that's failed because workers have been so suppressed that the neoliberal generation is the first generation of of the elite who decided they wanted to do without organised labour. Andrew Carnegie may have massacred steel strikers with machine guns, but he also built libraries and concert halls uh, because he wanted a, a civilised labour movement. Uh, not so the era uh, we live in. They would rather not have a labour movement because, of course, you can't set up a contract cleaning business, a uh, coffee bar company, a, a, a security guard company, a minicab company with labour rights. You can't do that kind of business. And so what I, I like the Luddites. I don't like using the word Luddite as an insult. But let's just hold, put that on hold and let's just use it for an insult for the moment. I think the modern Luddites are the entrepreneurs who set up these businesses. Because what they should be doing is sequencing DNA or genetic medicine uh, or redesigning products so that they are carbon free. But they don't. 
They've mobilized capitalism, again, capital again and again, into low wage, low value, high employment businesses. So it's a dead end. I argue a new route has, op has opened up, and here's what it is. Information technology does something really, really interesting. So interesting, in fact, that most mainstream economists can't get their heads around it. But the economist Paul Romer explained what it was in 1990. Mainstream economics tells us that if, if you can reproduce something for nothing, its price is going to eventually fall to nothing. So command C, <coughs> command V, copy paste, makes an information good different to, say, a cigarette. Yes, we could, I can smoke one inch of a cigarette, you can smoke the next, if it's one of those kinds of cigarettes. Uh, <laughs> but we cannot both smoke the same inch of the same cigarette, nor can we both park in the same parking space. Nor can we both, in the era of vinyl records, play the same vinyl record. You know, I play it, then you play it. But with information goods, they are so-called non-rival. So I can use it while you're using it, and, it, and neither of us degrades it. This, and it's been long recognised, according to the normal economic, normal mainstream price theory, means that in a free market with competition, the price of such goods should fall close to zero over time. We'll come to why it doesn't in a minute, and forgive me for overrunning slightly. Uh, if, if that is the case then this makes information goods completely different than all of the goods. It makes them effectively abundant. And as we, you know, economics is based on scarcity. And there's been a long history of, of utopian thinking around what would happen if things became abundant. It's just that nobody could imagine. It, usually utopias are like, we've got more than enough cheese. We've got a cheese mountain. You can eat the cheese until you know, every human being has too much cheese, but there's still cheese. But no, that's not the, that's not the kind of abundance we're talking about with with information technology, we're talking about infinite abundance because, love me do, 1963, sitting on iTunes server in Cupertino, uh, California, can be played by everybody on earth. It doesn't need to be owned by anybody. Uh, and so can every other track. Why is it 99p? Here we come to the problem. Uh, because a new kind of monopoly has grown up simply to defend price and the price the price mechanism, because the price mechanism is, I would argue, so challenged by information technology that left to its own devices, it would simply fall apart. Now, actually, any Marxist in the room, any labour theory of value people, it also works with the labour theory of value. Because if the input to something is zero, labour terms, then, the, then, then it's the amount of value it is, uh, embodies, according to Smith and also uh, Marx's understanding of how labour sits inside a commodity is also zero. So take your pick on the theory. The, the outcome is the same. It, there is this zero marginal cost effect of information technology that could do what? If we used it right and used it in, um, in a revolutionary and transformative way, it would put us on route one to a highly abundant society. And I'll come to that. The next thing, I'll skip straight through this because I've also talked for too long, is that the information t technology is eroding the relationship between work and wages. My common experience is to get on a plane in the morning, 7 a.m., sit with 300 other uh, you know, kind of high corporate wage slaves, so close that you can't actually you know, do typing without touching your neighbour. And, and if it was a factory, it would be closed down uh, because, of, because of its unsanitary conditions. But we're all working, and in fact, that's what we're doing. But none of us being paid. That nobody says, oh, you got on the plane. No, you're... the only people who do are lawyers. I am no worker. <laughs> yeah? the, le the elite labour aristocracy of the world. Um, but So work and wages are being eroded. Uh, at the top end, that's the experience. At the bottom end, the experience of the cleaner who, who clocks on by text message, I'm here, cleans for six hours, clocks off by text message, I'm here, never sees the boss. All the boss has to do is prove the cleaner was there for six hours. Why? Because this le the... the, the, the uh, the amount of labour expended in these low, low-skilled occupations is barely, is ba barely matters to the commercial uh, entities that are trading in it. It's just the fact that it's been done. They're not concerned about the quality or the or most, even the output sometimes. The third thing that information technology is doing, it is eroding so, uh, on wages. It is eroding ownership and hierarchy. Why did we need work and wages to be linked in the 20th century? Because if you turn up, 
you know, the, the production line starts here. You've got to be here. I've got to be here. If you don't tweak that screw, it, I can't do my bit. So me and you both clock on at the same time, clunk, we're there. At the end of the day, clock off, the machine stops or the shift changes. That's the 20th century. Now, information technology brings modular work, targeted work, freer work. And of course, as soon as we could do it, what then happened? We started to produce things that were for free, that were modular, that were non-managed, that were non-hierarchical and collaboratively produced and even owned. Wikipedia is a good example. Linux runs the top 500 uh, supercomputers in the world. Apache runs half of all web servers in the world. These are free products used, produced as open source by teams of people voluntarily. And the, they're so fundamental that a lot of capitalism now relies on them. When I give this list, people often say, well, commercial people, you know, hedge fund people, give us, tell me something more spectacular than that. Well, actually, I don't need to because, because the open source principle is creating new things every day. And what is creating are solutions, solutions that don't need to have the <coughs> version 10, you know, uh, like Windows. They don't need to have uh, you know, every six months a new version of it um, explodes your computer because they're, they're built for to, to, to be solutions on a human scale. So, to kind of cut to the chase, what would we do if this was all true? And I'll just say one other thing. I've designed this argument to be challengeable. Of course, you can challenge every little bit of this zero price thing, ditto the critique of neoliberalism. So if there is a, if there is a logical flaw in it, let's hear about it. But, mo but most of the critiques don't focus on that. Um, because the zero price thing is something that mainstream economics just really has a trouble get, getting its head around. And, and what, in the talks I've been doing about the book, what emerges, in the obje I'll give you what the objection is, I'll give you a sort of potted version, is this. All right, well, look, these massive monopolies are there forever. They're going to be there forever, and so is asset capitalism versus productive capitalism. So the rich will always live off their fine wine collections, their vintage cars, their, their three or four houses here and there that they rent out to other people. The poor will just stagnate. Their wages will be stagnant forever. And, um, and, and then, to cap it all, as the Oxford Martin Institute predicts, 47% of all jobs will then be automated by robots or robotics. And I think it's possible. But then, what's the outcome? Uh, the, logical out, the logical way to describe that outcome, actually, is neo-feudalism. Because it's not capitalism. It's a form of capitalism implemented by lawyers and IP lawyers. And, uh, of course, on the, given that 47% of people lose their jobs, there'll be a few <coughs> security specialists needed as well. It's a form of capitalism implemented by legal coercion that is non-granular, that doesn't reproduce itself without law and hierarchy and institution from above. And I think that's the reason why I, I tend to discount the possibility of that happening. It will neither be a stable nor a self-reproducing system. More likely is we're in for a long transition in which the market, the state, and the non-market, the, the voluntarily produced co cooperative product, coexist with each other. And what would you do if you believed that? This is what I would do. I would regulate the economy to promote the latter, to promote that part of the economy in which there is abundance and to promote the delinking of work and wages strategically so that, yes, we could then automate the blocked automation process. We could then automate half the jobs and we could share out the remaining labour in a logical way that was not then mediated through the market. I think that's what we're going to have to do. Once we start doing that, it won't seem like capitalism to a lot of capitalists, and that's why a good label for it is post-capitalism. What will the outcome be? Uh, I think the outcome is reliant on the parallel process that is unleashed by information technology, the human revolution that produces a new kind of human behaviour, new kinds of human values, the kind of values that make people want to do Wikipedia, that make people want to throw gifts into effectively a gift economy in the hope of that something else decent comes back to them. It's quite an unusual, that alongside which there is this creation of multiple personalities among young people using te technology. I think the outcome of the, the final, the, the final outcome of the transition is going to be uh, predicated on what, this, what happens to human thinking and behaviour. Final sentence. And no, I haven't talked about climate change. And the reason I don't do it, in the book there's an entire 
chapter on climate change and demographics as exogenous external shocks that will impact this process and force us to accelerate some of the measures we need to take. But the reason I, I <laughs> leave it to, to almost a single sentence is because there are, more, there are people more expert than me. And in fact, over 10 to 15 years, it has sunk in quite well into the elite of society that something has to be done about climate change. They still don't even get 101 of this. They don't even get that, that neoliberalism is broken. And so many of the people I speak to in the kind of global elite and its institutions just cannot get their heads around the possibility that we could, could be living through the first stages of a technologically driven abundance. Uh, and that's why I spend so much time talking about that, so that when this little person um, uh, grows up enough to understand it, um, maybe it'll have sunk in a bit more. Thank you. Okay, so while you guys get your questions ready, we have two roaming mics and two roaming mic handlers that are going to um, come and find you. So, uh, if you can be thinking of your questions, I'm just going to kick us off with one opener, which is that... Oh, no, no, no. Not on that mic. Um, the whole post-capitalism kind of phenomenon My has really... Watcher. Oh, sorry. This is like cash. It's like... Um, has really kind of... As we were saying earlier, it's taken off, and not just in terms of sales of the book, but it's... I'm oh, sorry, I'm really... Oh, we're double mic. We're double mic here. This one. That's all. Yeah? Thank you. Okay, yeah, good. Okay. Start again. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, the whole post-capitalism um, agenda has taken off just in terms of book sales, but also kind of, it's become cross-cultural. Yeah. Um, and has that surprised you? Because it seems to, every day on Twitter, it's become a kind of its own existing hashtag. And I see it popping up in the most unusual places. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, it doesn't surprise me because the book is quite cross-cultural. <laughs> um, the book, um, the, most books anger about a thousand people who are doing PhDs on a particular topic. But there's ten chapters in this book, <coughs> each of which has got a thousand PhDs uh, from different uh, uh, from different uh, disciplines. Mm. So there's the discipline of, of what you might call long cycle <coughs> theory, uh, Kondratiev. There's the discipline of crisis theory, and I go into in there, you know, critiquing the sort of classic Marxist crisis theory because it, it, what I believe is is inadequacy. And also there's politics, and then there's an account. There's a long. If Penguin hadn't cut it, the longest bit of the book would have been this account of uh, what I believe to be the kind of demise of working class culture. And combativity that allowed this defeat to take place. <coughs> because I actually wanted to tell it in such detail. But those of you who read the book will know there's a sort of several pages about my grandma in it. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it has an eclectic style. This book, but um, it's the idea that for me, I wanted to reconstruct a te not a teleological, a, a meta narrative about where, how capitalism can be superseded. And I think it is. There doesn't. If there's an inner contradiction, which I think it is, the information technology creates the contradiction, then there also has to be an agent of history and there has to be a dual outcome, a good and a bad outcome. And I think the agent of history thing has to be, I've had to address it head on, and it is that thing about, is it the working class uh, as constituted in the mid 20th century? And I argue in the book, no, because I, I think that actually, although there were ridiculed at the time, rightly, people like Marcuse and Daniel Bell, who was at the time a left-winger, and who was no right-winger, what became a right-winger, uh, and people like the French Marxist André Gortz, who wrote a book famously saying that the working class was dead, were way ahead of their time, and wrong then, but the, the, the things they were describing were the incipient, the incipient qualities which have produced what, I, what we call, in this theory, the networked individual. And I think the networked individual is the, is, the, is the agent of history. It's quite hard for a lot of traditional left-wing people to accept. It's key going forward as well. Though. Well, I mean, 2011, to me, a lot of my time since 2011 has been spent trying to understand and report on, up, on unrest and uprisings. And um, it's, I've watched again and again from, from Greece, Turkey, the Arab Spring, Egypt, 
again and again, traditional leftists say, yeah, it's no, we, yeah, we've got these students with Facebook, and they're, yeah, of course, yeah, they've taken the square, and yeah, they've set up with a kind of guitar band, and it's all amazing, and everybody's obsessed with them, they're t white teeth and beautiful looking people. Wait till the workers come along. And actually, even in Egypt, where the workers did come along and made an incredible contribution to the overthrow of Mubarak, that they did not imprint their <coughs> sociological or, or, or even strategic uh, interests onto that revolution. And I don't regard that as a kind of 1848 style, those of you who know what I'm talking about, 1848 uh, French Revolution, uh, failure of the, of the most important stage. It's simply a fact that the kind of revolution and the kind of societal change I think is possible is not encompassed and not and it's also not achievable simply by relying on what comes out of manual working class culture even when that's quite militant as it was in Greece and as it was in Egypt um, it's something bigger is happening and that's again I mean I'm, I hope there's the socialist worker are outside I hope they're also inside and, and the, you, people have a discussion about that because the, the left in Britain I think doesn't want to it's kind of politely stuck because the critique of neoliberalism is so bitter in my book and it winds up so many right wingers uh, that, that it, people sometimes politely forget that I'm also attacking the, the, the 20th century concept of, of a, what a revolution would be. With that in mind, can we have hands up for questions? We have about 15 minutes. So can I just ask that um, when you're actually giving your question, you speak clearly into the microphone. If our, can we find some questions with our roving mics, please, on both sides? Starting at the front. Why not? Where does the middle class sit in this future of yours? Do you want me to answer? Yeah, sure. I, 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 don't, I don't... Well, look, the, the Western middle class is being hollowed out. There's a great... I don't know if we've got a board, have we? No, but, I mean, look, I can even draw it with my finger. There's a great... Um, there's a, Branko Milanovic, who is a World Bank economist, draws this thing. The results of globalisation were... Imagine this is... Um, OK, this is the poorest people. This is the richest 5%. That's the poorest 5%. Most globalization's impact has been high in, and, and good for about the, top, the bottom 60% of society and then almost none or negative for the top 35% of society and spectacular for the top 5%. So this bit here, globally, worldwide, is the working class and the lower middle class. And it's, what, what, you, you know, what does it matter to you? Um, it, unless you're part of the, hereditary, the growing hereditary ruling elite in Western society, it, it, it barely matters to you that you've been to, you, you can go to Oxford or Cambridge or indeed Leeds Beckett and come out of it with your 45, if you're doing medicine, you'll be, you know, 45, 50, 55k debt. You're not middle class. What, no matter how kind of nice your accent is or no matter how you know, pristine your little hoodie is that you're wearing, that's not being middle class. Being middle class is having assets to take from one generation to the next. And I think neoliberalism is hollowing out. As to the where do they sit? I mean, I would describe most of the movers and shakers in, although not all, in some of the revolutions that, that happened in between 2011 and 2013 uh, as being lower middle class. So especially in Brazil, you know, everybody's been dancing around like pixies going kind of, whoopee, you know, the Brazilians have come out of the slums and they've now got a middle class. It was that a million of them went on the streets. The, the actual slum dwellers were largely... Uh, again, tail, you know, I, I kind of tailed the uh, the mobilisation in Brazil in 2013. It was a mobilisation of this salaried, i.e., you get a wage and you have to have a bank account, um, employee. Okay. Can we move freely? Hands up, please. Can we take one from the back left? Um. What is going to happen and what has to happen to private property rights in order for the scenario that you're describing yeah. um, to come about? So I think they have to, they'll be corroded. They'll be corroded. Obviously, see, the point about Wikipedia is it makes an encyclopedia business impossible to run. And even if you wanted to, if you wanted to set up a, if Uber's bosses said, right now we've screwed every minicab company in the world, now let's have a go at Wikipedia, you'd have to employ 27,000 people and, and employ them to write and maintain pages. And my, the theory, my, my idea, and it's not just me, the people who, I suppose, peer-to-peer -peer technology and 
commons-based production, believe that we will always do it more efficiently than a, than a commercial uh, rival would. And that it's only by literally walking in and doing a smash and grab raid on regulation that companies like this can actually even resist, that people like Uber even resist this effect in their own market. You, Uber right now kind of wait, laying waste to local regulations, but you wait until, wait until the regulatory playing field levels and you know, Leeds Council can set up its own app. Wait till then. You watch how many lawyers and public public uh, public uh, relations people will be deployed to stop that happening, as they are in Brussels right now, or to to keep Airbnb and Uber legal. Um, so I think that's number one. Number two, uh, there's an important thing to say about intellectual property, though. The economist Kenneth Arrow in the 1960s, when we first started thinking about intellectual property as economics. See, in the, in the war, and just after the war, we thought about, intellect, about ideas as public knowledge, like a big library, free public knowledge. But then people started to think, oh, that's not what ideas are. And Arrow says, in a, in a society that has a free market and private property, it, when people, if people start producing ideas, as intellectual property, the outcome will be the systemic underutilization of information. Now, just turn that sentence around algebraically and, and you can come up with this. A society in which there is full utilization of information cannot be one in which intellectual property based on private property and a free market actually exist. And what do I, what, what's the implication for creators, including me, with me, whatever it costs now, £15 book? Yeah? What, what's, what's the implication? The implication is. Whenever you create information, an information good, intellectual property that can only exist as information, you are taking a massive risk that it will be that its price will at some point be zero because somebody pirates it or somebody works out how to do it legally like you've done it. Uh, and I think that the response to that, the logical response, is to actually build in probably higher but shorter rewards to to intellectual creators to say, you know, if you meet a Hollywood lawyer, all they're interested in is, is making sure that, you know, the, 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 the intellectual property rights on, you know, um, to have and to have not last until the middle of, you know, beyond the Earth's core melting down. You know, um, so never mind 70 years, you know, it's to, for all times and in perpetuity, even when the actual Earth has exploded and we're all atoms, there was, you know, you know, Warner Brothers will still own that movie. Um, this, is not, this is not logical. Um, what is logical is to say, reward me quickly and let the, and let the, the, the intellectual property, the, the, the copyright, tail away quickly. Um, this, is, this is what is functionally happening to, with, when, you know, when India basically defied uh, the World Pharmaceutical uh, uh, Corporations and started producing uh, HIV uh, therapy drugs gene generically. That's already happening in the world of pharma. But the intellectual property uh, world, it's, oh my God, we, that could never happen. Well, it will happen. Okay. Take a question from this side. <coughs> Up and to the right, please. Thank you very much. Um, you talk about the networked individual, and um, uh, I've started to read your book in little bits and bobs here and there. And uh, my understanding is, as you said before, that there is uh, the state, the market as it is now, the corporation, mm. etc., and then a new sector of the economy. And uh, you seem to rely on this idea of Jokai Bentley as well, of, yeah. of the network community, the individual, the small start to a start of this. Uh, non-hierarchical coordination. Yeah. Now, when we look around us, us in, in our world nowadays, we see that a lot of the goods that we consume, whether we need them or not, mm. some of them we need them, and a lot of the innovations that we need, you know, empowering innovations that probably have a very long-term rate of uh, return, uh, long-term investment, mm. these things, how can they be uh, produced, how can be delivered, in a non-hierarchical, uncoordinated way if you need economies of scale. If you, do you think an energy and banking are not the only things that should be relatively more centralised? That's a really, fun, it's a really good uh, question. Uh, and it goes to the heart of some of the problems about the transition that, that, that I suggest. 
First of all, the person you mentioned, Yokai Benkler, is the author of a book called The Wealth of Networks, and whose work has influenced me. And but I, I it was Benkler who first suggested that peer-to-peer -peer network technology could be creating a new mode of production. Unfortunately, he never expanded that. And what I've tried to do in the book is to ex is to explore what that would mean. I think what it, the problem of scale, I think, is easy. I think the problem of scale is not a problem, because information being modular, uh, and actually, you know, what I say in the book is that we need to take some centralised decisions about, for example, energy. So you can't write off four trillion uh, dollars worth of stranded assets in the carbon companies uh, by decentralised action. You can force it by decentralised action, and you see some decentralised action take place on the streets of Paris when COP21 starts next month. But Centralised action means you, you, we're basically going to have to take over, probably control, own and write off, destroy um, the carbon generating energy companies. They're going to have to do that. <coughs> Decentralised energy systems are, are the sine qua non of how energy should work. Of course, decentralisation of consumption and production, so the classic combined <coughs> heat and power you know, uh, utopias of, of local, local energy generation, would work very well if you could at the same time do a massive thing which, well what is it, is it centralising or not? If you put solar arrays in the Sahara and then you know, thermal uh, energy in Norway and link them up so that some, everybody in between them could draw the energy down. What is that? It's, you know, is it a hierarchy? Yes, but it's a kind of structured one which allows networks to form around it. Likewise with banking. Actually in banking, we're seeing now, I mean I'm not a money utopian. I'm not, I don't let me put it politely, I don't really care whether Bitcoin exists or not. Um, I, I think my, 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 the blockchain, which is the, the, the technology within it, is an interesting <coughs> possibility. But with this blockchain, uh, which is a, a way of creating secure money, what people are starting to do is to think through what would a financial instrument look like if it, could not, if it was, was decentralised. Uh, and it's a weird concept, because how could it be? Likewise... Peer-to-peer -peer lending is, is underway now. You get these peer-to-peer -peer lenders on a capitalist basis, but also, as Castells, the, um, the sociologist who more or less invented the term networked individual, discusses, you know, in, in Catalonia during the crisis after 2008, he found that one in three people he interviewed had lent money on a non-interest basis to a non-family member. So you're getting peer-to-peer -peer finance happening on an informal basis. My, my, my kind of total answer to, to, to what is the challenge is... And this is what makes my work different to and slightly unpopular with the network from below people, is I think the whole thing's going to happen if we clear a space within capitalism for it to happen. And that has to be done as ruthlessly as capitalism created a space, cleared a space for the factory system. You know, there was, at one point there was only one factory. There was one Wikipedia. Now, at one point there was Richard Artwright's factory um, in Cromford. And then because somebody moved to Germany... Um, who'd worked at it, there was a place set up called Cromford in, um, in, in, in Dusseldorf or somewhere. And, uh, you know, so, so basically, eventually it spreads. Uh, but, but to make it go from two to many thousands, they had to say, you know, factories are good, weavers bad, you know, uh, weaving in a cottage, you know, well, no, you suppress you. Uh, you protest about machines, bang, you're in jail. That's the Luddites, that's the, the uprising, Captain Swig. So there's a struggle to be had. And I think that struggle is a struggle for... Uh, the reason why I've kind of put it very, very mildly, because I think it's going to take a long time. This is not a kind of Soviet-era 20-year you know, march to freedom. It's going to take a while, but the first act to do is to say, let's create the space where things like Wikipedia are normal and things like Uber are not really going to happen. OK, we've got time for one more question. Can we take something from the centre on that side, just in front of you? Just in front of you, and down. Lady there, you had your hand up? Right on your left. Mm -hmm. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Capitalism may have failed in the way you said, but we still need capital, as this gentleman saying there, to invest in new technologies and new manufacturing. Developing a new type of steel, for example, mm. or a new electric motor, or a new type of drug. Where is this capital going to come from if capitalism's failed? I mean, and that is an excellent question, thank you. I mean, because I, I, in, if I'm... It, so if I 
and in the book, you know, those of you who read it or want to read it, I try at some length to try and to, to basically say this is the, to, to, to explore the problems of transition, drawing on such knowledge that we have from the two transitions we've lived through, one of which was feudalism to capitalism, which took about several hundred years. The other one is the Soviet attempt, which failed. And I'm not advocating the, a return to the Soviet attempt, but there's some interesting lessons. The lesson you learn from the Soviet attempt is the lesson that the economists associated with what became Trotskyism, the left opposition in the, in the Russian Bolshevik party, uh, thought, which was you can't, as it were, storm the plan. The, you know, uh, Five-year planning, you know, relentless attempts to build up uh, primary industries, you know, dams, electrification plants, uh, heavy, st heavy steel works, is, is, is not going to work unless you have um, a, a controlling mind that can constantly alter the plan to fit what is necessary. And they said explicitly, the market will control the plan. That was actually what got some of them executed for saying there is a place for the market inside a Soviet-style economy. Now, I'm, I'm not advocating the Soviet-style economy, but what I do think we can learn from that debate is that if we're in, in a period where this, we've now got three things, we've got, this, remember, you know, G4S, all those people who, you know, the, the, the kind of huge, quote, quote, unquote, private sector in Britain uh, only exists because the state gives it money to for services. Um, it, the state, in other words, is bigger than, than it looks in the economy, even now. And then you've got the pure private sector, you know, like, um, you know, Tata Steel, uh, you know, trading with, you know, uh, a coal mine here and a bauxite plant there. All right, that's the private sector. And then you've got the, you've got the, the network sector, let's call it that, the, the post-capitalist sector. I think they will, they will interact. Um, and I think that the, the if I'm right and we need to design the transition and, and, and different people can do it at different paces and modularly, then what is important is, is to create, is literally to create instruments, financial instruments and mechanisms that can match. It's, we're no longer just, I mean, basically, it's like apples, oranges and pears, the state, the market and the post-capitalist sector. We've got to have a way of mobilising resources between them. The post-capitalist sector doesn't need investment per se, it needs time. And one of the best ways of creating a post-capitalist sector would be to give people more time. So the basic income for me is a subsidy for the transition to automation and a subsidy that creates a, a time-rich, skilled workforce that does things for free. But yeah, you're absolutely right. During that tr transition, there will still be, have to be efficient mechanisms <coughs> for mobilising normal traditional capital into you know, traditional innovative businesses. And I, I think you know, it, neoliberalism doesn't do that very well because what it does is the finance system sucks out the capital and the human capital, the talent, into speculative finance. Um, so many quants, so many you know, to <coughs> physicists going into quantitative analysis in the city is the classic you know, example of this, um, we need to put the physicists and the metallurgists back into, into doing that. And, and I, think, I think I would do that bit in a classically statist way. If we need a steel industry in Britain and that Stocks, uh, what is it, not Stocksbridge, is it Stocksbridge? Is the specialist steel part of Tata Steel. I went there about four weeks ago, stunningly amazing. Uh, you make these amazing giant ingots, you know, um, as tall as this room. Three blokes with kind of, <laughs> with um, you know, X, what they call you know, Xbox style controllers are just controlling the thing. They're non-skilled, they're not graduates. That's how that's made. So, so yeah, we need more of that. But it, that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is, information technology is going to automate the world. It is going to destroy the price mechanism. It does create this problem for an ever-expanding credit system premised on ever-expanding return on that credit that can't happen. That's the essential point, and that's why I focus my, my brain onto that problem and not the traditional problem of capital allocation under normal market circumstances. And one thing we are short of, as always, is time. Um, if you can sit on any remaining questions, we will be coming back to you in the audience as part of the Q&A after Boom Bust. But can you please join me for now in thanking Paul Mason?